Welcome to the Earthshift series. This is a continuation of my apocalyptic prophecy series, so make sure you go back and watch that first. We left off exploring the conversations with Nostradamus books by Dolores Cannon. And when Dolores moved John into a future life through hypnosis in the year 2087, he was told that a one world government was established in 2039. That was 10 years after the shift. And as we see below, there aren't many people on Earth. There are about 120 million people in 2087. Later in the book, Nostradamus shares the astrological alignment of the Earth shift. And here is the chart that he gave. And of course, Nostradamus did not give exact dates. He gave planetary alignment, and then the astrologer worked backwards from those alignments to find the date. And what they received was October 24th, 2029. An earth shift is when the magnetic poles of the planet tilt. And a shift like this could cause massive flooding. According to NASA, in 2030 is when we will start to have the coastal floods. Also according to NASA, on Friday the 13th, 2029, a 1,000 foot asteroid is going to come closer to earth than any other asteroid has. Something this large, this close, could affect our magnetic field. But NASA says people are going to go outside and marvel at their good luck because it will glide across the sky faster than any satellite and brighter than any star. Also, according to NASA, in as early as the year 2030, the moon will wobble. And when it wobbles, it's going to cause great floods. In 1973, MIT researchers developed a World One program. This program would basically use sequencing patterns to detect the end of the world. This computer program predicted that it would end in the year 2040, and the first catastrophes would start in 2020, and that the quality of life would greatly decrease in the year 2020. I'd like to make a note that the people who paid for this was the Club of Rome. Who's the Club of Rome, you ask? The Club of Rome is a group of elites from all over the world that come together to discuss strategies around natural and unnatural catastrophic events. The organization is broken up into 10 kingdoms slash groups. Then there's Sir Isaac Newton, who analyzed all of the prophecies of the apocalypse and came to the conclusion that the world would end by 2060. In the next part, we're gonna talk about the pole shifts and how our pole already is shifting and coming up in the series, how to quantum leap humanity out of this catastrophe and create a beautiful new world for all of us. Stay tuned. Let's talk a little bit about what a pole shift actually is. Okay, so let's start with the basics. We know there's a North Pole. So this is the geographic North Pole. This is the North Pole we all know about, you know, where Santa Claus allegedly lives. And it's where all the meridians of the Earth, the lines of longitude intersect at the top. But since the Earth is like a big magnet, there's actually the magnetic North Pole, which is where your compass is pointing to. Not that one, your compass is pointing to the magnetic pole. So based on historical evidence, there's rocks that show that the North Pole might have been the South Pole at one point. So in 1831, the magnetic North Pole was in the Canadian Arctic. In the 1940s, when researchers went back, they saw that it had moved 250 miles. So as we can see here, 
This is the progression of it over the years. By the year 1990, it had moved another 600 miles. That's over 900 kilometers. It used to move at 10 kilometers, six miles a year. Now it's moving at 40 kilometers a year, which is 25 miles a year. Soon the Earth's magnetic pole will be located in Siberia. Okay, so there's two schools of thought when it comes to the pole shift theory. So first there's Charles Hapgood's theory, which was endorsed by Albert Einstein. And it says that the poles are periodically moving. Then there's the Chan Thomas school of thought, which says that the poles can shift up to 90 degrees in less than one day. So now Charles Hapgood believed in the crustal displacement, AKA physical pole shift. This means the actual crust of the planet shifting. This is the type that Albert Einstein endorsed. Evidence of this is that in Siberia, there's the woolly mammoths that were just snap frozen. It says here there, some of them were still chewing food as they were frozen, which shows that this was a physical shift that happened quickly. It's also believed that the last time this happened was 12,000 years ago, which many believe this was the last great flood, which is what took down Atlantis. While many others believe that this great flood of Atlantis was actually the Noah's Ark flood. Then there's a magnetic pole shift, geomagnetic reversal. So the Earth's rotation and orbit are not affected and the crust stays where it is. It's the magnetic field that shifts. It's said that these happen every 250,000 years, but it's been 780,000 years since one's happened. Now it's believed what could cause this type of magnetic shift would be if the Earth's magnetic field got weaker to the point where it's not stabilized and maybe something like an asteroid or anything or many other factors could cause the weakened magnetic field to lose its place and shift. And since 2014, that magnetic field continues to get weaker. And could this shift possibly have an effect on our climate? Okay, now that we got the science out of the way, let's get to souls and aliens and all that fun stuff. In this part, we're going to discuss the spiritual aspects of this coming Earth shift. So as you remember from the apocalyptic series, we were exploring Dolores Cannon's work and those Nostradamus books were based on hypnosis sessions in the 80s. Dolores continued doing this work until 2014 when she passed away. And as she continued doing this hypnosis work, over the years, more and more of her subjects started giving the exact same information. Clients that had never met all started talking about the same thing, that an earth shift was coming and that their soul chose to be on earth at this time to be a part of this shift. So let's read something from the Convoluted Universe book two. So here in chapter 30, Dolores quotes the book of Revelation. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, come down from God out of the heavens. Now in this same chapter, she discusses a vision of the future that a woman named Annie Kirkwood had. And she basically saw the earth like a cell dividing into two. So she was on one earth with her friends celebrating. They did the quantum leap. They made it. And then she got a vision of her sister who was on the older. And her sister says, poor girl. She was telling all these people that this thing was going to happen. And she was just crazy. And she just died. So the people on the old earth were not able to perceive the people on the new earth. And this earth, this timeline, this dimension will continue to go through the end of the old ways, the crumbling of the structures and the people on the new earth would get to live in prosperity in the way they manifested the future to be. Here's an excerpt from another one of her clients. The earth is going through a transition. The whole idea is that we just have to get people to expand a little bit and those that cannot change will be left behind. The earth is going to expand into another dimension. Dolores asks, like a separation, like two earths? The client says, no, it's a changing of dimensions. It will be a physical earth just like the one we are in now. Further down, and it will be like two worlds? Yes, two worlds existing at the same time, but not always aware of each other. Now let's look at an excerpt from Convoluted Universe Book 3. We're going to get more into those left behind, but first, all eyes are on earth right now. This is a big one. Many fought to be here. Even children that come in only for a couple hours, they will all carry the badge of having been here. To have been on this planet at the time of this kind of evolution, no planet has ever quite evolved in this way before, this uniquely. So even a soul that was only here for a few hours will be able to say, I was on earth at the time of evolution. Let's go back to the Nostradamus book. Nostradamus said, the spirits on earth at this time are here because they chose to be here because they knew that any spirit on earth at this time would be working through large amounts of major karma. 
The souls that are on earth at this time were aware of the consequences before coming into this life. This is why there are more old souls on earth during any other time in history. Let's get deeper. <laughs> Guys, welcome back. We're jumping right in. I'm sure after the last video, you have a lot of questions. I'm going to continue to explain the new earth. Jumping back into Convoluted Universe Book 2. The new earth is another dimension. We will move into a new dimension. In the last part, we talked about if you are on earth at this time, which clearly you are if you're watching this video, that your soul chose to be here at this time to be a part of this shift, this evolution of the planet into a new dimension, into a higher consciousness. Those who are working for the earth, for the universe, will be provided for and will continue to be. What you need will come to you. So it's time to let go of the ethic of working to get money. You are working to change the earth. Your work must come from love and service, not from greed. In Convoluted Universe, they talk about the two types of ways that the earth can shift. The crust could shift, and then you would start from ground zero. That's what killed off the Ice Age and killed the dinosaurs. Then there's times that there's been dimensional shifts. They say that Atlantis and Lumeria experience dimensional shift. There are groups that have done this before, including the Mayans, why they just happened to disappear, and other civilizations that are surrounded with mystery that simply disappeared, leaving no clues of what happened to their civilization. They raised themselves to a certain frequency and their consciousness expanded and we were not able to perceive them in our reality anymore. Those who had raised their frequency and vibration would ascend into a new earth as it evolved and lifted into a new dimension, thus becoming invisible to those left behind. This goes into the theory of parallel universes. Dolores gives a very simple explanation. Anytime an individual has to make a decision, this is called coming to a crossroad. They will decide to go one way or another, whether to get married, whether to get divorced, whether to start a job, whether to leave their job. When you put thought into making a decision, you give energy to both realities. When you make the choice to go down the path of one reality, that becomes the world that you perceive. However, all the energy that you put towards the other decision that energy is not going to be destroyed because you didn't walk that path. So that energy continues to become a reality. It says this is a simple explanation, but it doesn't only happen with major decisions. Another version of you always splits off and plays a different part. Our human minds would never be able to handle it all. And it says the way that we're not able to perceive the other versions of ourselves, say you quit your job. There's another version of you that's still working at that job and didn't quit. You're living your life without that job, but another aspect of yourself still exists at that job that you wanted to quit. But you're never going to be able to perceive the reality that you didn't quit that job. And that's what would happen with the new earth on a grander scale. The people on the two earths would be unaware of each other. And we're going to get into this, all of the chaos and turmoil that is coming. But here it says that the people who came to earth at this time need to stay grounded and tranquil for others. This is why a lot of the older souls who are here to work on this earth shift experienced childhood trauma and abuse so that they would be able to be a pillar for others during a time of chaos. Those who are here now need to remember the important role they are playing. Guys, welcome back. Thanks for being here. Don't worry, I'm not done explaining the new earth yet. Once again, Dolores quotes the Bible. There will be two men in bed. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together and one will be taken, one will be left. It is still up to us to decide which earth we will gravitate towards because of our free will. Since this has never happened before, is why it is the greatest show in the universe and everyone from many different galaxies and dimensions are watching to see what will happen. Once again, we keep bringing up how the people who are here on Earth at this time chose to be a part of this. It's time for them to show up and be aware that they are being called to be present and ready. There might be situations where the soul has a crucial point where they decide where they want to go vibrationally. Their spiritual growth may be a great area where they may qualify to step up into a higher vibration, only if they have the courage to jump. Or they might choose not to, and that will be their choice. But your role is to keep your energy, because it may be crucial for someone in that situation. You may be the hand that extends for them to jump. Now this session takes place in around 2001, 2002, where this information came through. And it says, it is just beginning, but the chaos has not begun. The chaos is going to come when the people's illusions have been shattered. 
Some of those things will be caused by natural disasters. Some will be caused by those in power who are making every effort to keep things the way they are. It's like a child who doesn't want to hear the truth. They refuse to admit that they are no longer in charge. They feel they will be able to stop this by maintaining people in a low vibration, by keeping fear on the surface. Fear is the way they've maintained power. And almost everyone in this world is in fear. On the surface, they are showing us fear, but it is dissipating despite what we see. This process that's happening, this earth shift, this new earth, this dimensional shift, those in power are very aware of. They want to slow it down. They think there might be a way to prevent it. So they will push and push every extreme that they can to make things very difficult. And like I said, because this is um, from 2001, 2002, she asks about the war. You know, the war we're still in 20 years later. She says, is the war one of the things? It says, yeah, the war, but also the diseases that they will scare people with. Dolores says, are the de diseases not really there? Of course they can be there if people allow those energies into their body. For the most part, there are only energetic fields. But like anything else that is talked about or thought about, it can become reality in your physical. The diseases are extremely blown out of proportion. And epidemics are not what they are portrayed to be. The media and movies show you desperation that they insist on presenting to the masses Subject says murder, death, and betrayal to keep consciousness focused on fear. They will use the diseases to give people a reason to stay afraid and not unify and to trust that the government will help save their problems. On a subconscious level, they are awakening and the powers know this. They are presenting the masses with the opportunity to choose. Don't get caught up in what's going to happen. You've got to focus on the light. That will be the challenge for the people going to the new earth. That fear and sadness can pull them back down to the third dimension. I know what you're thinking. What about everyone that's left behind? What about all the other people? More information from the convoluted book series. Laura says, I was told that some will be left behind. I thought that sounded cruel. It's not cruel because each soul is given the choice. And if they are not moving and evolving, it's because they have chosen not to. It says it's all right because it's only a game. It doesn't matter what happens because it's all a game. It's all a play. And the things that are happening are happening for a reason. And that reason is to test each human being to find out where they are in their own soul's evolution. If we hold peace and light in the body, Dolores says there's so many people that aren't going to understand what's happening. She says she doesn't want to call them ordinary, but, and it says they are not ordinary. They only seem ordinary. It's a mask that they are wearing, but they are changing. Yes, some will choose to not awaken and that is their choice and we have to respect it. They have been given the same choice as every other soul and that's okay. It will be fine. The more people that awaken will take this journey and the more there will be in the new earth. And that's why so many of you are doing this work at this time. Everyone you speak to, you are doing the work. It says you may not be aware, but you are acting like Christ. Everyone you speak to becomes a disciple and they go out and in turn awaken other people. It is working and it is all happening soon. They say that your body is your own universe. If every person creates peace and harmony in their own universe, then that's the universe they will create in the fifth dimensional earth. Imagine your thoughts becoming energy. The more energy you give it, the stronger it becomes. It says when you send out this energy, it manifests and becomes real. It becomes physical. If you send out that there's going to be peace, then peace will follow. But if you continue to say, oh, but the war is getting worse and those politicians are making a big mistake, because then you are creating that reality. And this is why everything in the world is so negative and divisive right now. Because the true people in power realize that we as humans are creator being. Our thoughts, our words, is what shapes the reality around us. So that's why they continue to show us the negative images. They continue to show us that the world is getting worse and worse. This is why they show all of these movies of the apocalypse being destruction. They don't show the movies that the apocalypse means the unveiling of information, which is what it actually is. They show us all the death and the destruction so that that becomes our thoughts. That's what we talk about. And then that's how we create that timeline. So instead of going onto the new earth timeline, we go on to the New World Order timeline. It's the New Earth, New Jerusalem, whatever different religions call it. Everyone kind of talks about this. And then there's a New World Order timeline. If you can create a new reality by coming to peace and harmony inside of your body, then why is there all this information about how sick and weak our bodies are? So that we have disharmony in our universe, and then we create a disharmonic world. And we go back to the idea that light is information and darkness is the lack of information. This explains the censorship of any information outside the mainstream narrative. Anything that could relieve people of fear.
Okay guys, welcome back. Now that we have the basics of the spiritual shift, let's pull back a little and explain how some of these underlying concepts are explored within science. So we're gonna take some information from the Holographic Universe by Michael Talbot. And this is a theory in quantum physics that actually our reality is a hologram, not a physical reality. So the origin of a lot of this information came from David Bohm. Now Bohm's discoveries led him to believe that the reality we are experiencing might be a hologram. So one of Bohm's discoveries was that if you take a subatomic particle and do something to it, it affects other subatomic particles. And he said they could be 10 feet apart or 10 million feet apart. He said if they are traveling instantaneously, faster than the speed of light, are they affecting each other or are they the same thing? So he gives this really interesting example. Say right here, this is an aquarium with a fish inside. And then you have two cameras, one camera from the side and one camera facing the front. And let's say you don't know about aquariums. The only thing that you have are the images of the monitors from both of the cameras. So if you're watching these two monitors and the fish moves, you see that this fish moves, but then at the exact same time, this fish moves. So based on the limited information we would be looking at, just the monitors, we would come to the conclusion that when this moves, it affects this fish because we don't have the full knowledge to be able to see that it's just one fish. And this is where we get to one of the most quoted lines in literature. In this poem by William Blake, to see a world in a grain of sand. Scientist David Bohm, in some sense, man is a microcosm of the universe. Therefore, discovering man helps us discover the universe. And we can see this is our brain cell, and this is a picture of the universe. This is our eye, this is the nebula. This is the birth of a cell, the death of a star. Brain cells, observable universe, a fingerprint, a tree. Branches on a tree look like veins within the human body. Our organs show up exactly in the shape of the foods that help that organ. Like we've all heard, carrots are good for your eyes. Ginger is good for your stomach. So if a hologram is being able to view the entire image through just a piece of it, go back to the Dolores book, you are your own universe. You create harmony within your own universe, you will create harmony outside. Now, Bohm teamed up with Carl Pribram because he was working on this idea that our brain functions as a hologram. And through his discoveries, he saw that the brain was functioning in the exact way a hologram would. The way that we're talking about, there's a whole thing, but that each tiny part of it holds all the information of the whole. And together they came to the theory that although we believe our reality is a physical reality, it's actually a splendidly detailed hologram. The whole is within the part. So if each of us are a tiny part of a whole, then the positive changes we make within ourselves has the ability to affect the whole universe. So in order to shift a planet, you just need to shift yourself. So while we're on the topic of our reality might be a hologram, let's take a look at some declassified CIA documents. According to declassified documents, the gateway experience or gateway process or gateway program, I see it referred to as all three, was a CIA experiment and program to explore different aspects of mind power, including time travel through your mind, as well as remote viewing, and even some scary discoveries that I won't share just yet. And in this declassified document, this is a letter sent to a commander explaining what they have learned so far. They say that they see parallels between the electromagnetic field of the world and the waves of human consciousness the importance of human consciousness and energy, the idea that our reality might be a hologram, the parts encode the whole, that consciousness is a matrix of unbelievable complexity. The document uses diagrams from this book, not an easy read at all. One of my biggest takeaways from this book is that even a small action that we take ripples out to the entire universe. So if you're sitting in traffic and someone cuts you off and your reaction is to become angry and hateful and wish for that person to crash, then you actually ripple out that emotion into the entire freaking universe. Meaning beings that are living on other planets who are aware that they are part of a whole, unlike us who believe that we are individuals just thrown on this rock to be tortured and that there's no rhyme or reason to anything, just a series of unfortunate events. But those beings that are aware of everything being one part of the universe, the hatred you're sending towards that person in traffic has an effect on their planet at the same time. Now let's revisit some concepts from the holographic universe. 
he talks about the placebo effect, which we all know well. Also, this is the basis of Joe Dispenza's work. I highly suggest reading his books or at least watching any of his speeches. So this book says that the placebo effect is only more proof that our reality is a hologram. Because if someone can heal themselves just because they believe they took medicine that heals them, even if they haven't taken the medicine, their thought can create that process in the body. So the book really focuses on how what we believe to be reality is the reality that we will experience in the outer world. And he said that because of the science that we are taught in school, which is so definitive, which actually inhibits people from being able to understand on the quantum level the structure of reality because they are still looking at Newtonian physics. And a big thing in this book is the synchronicities. Now Talbot proposes the idea that synchronicities are being created from our own mind. Is it a coincidence? Or did your own idea and thought create it in the physical? And I'm sure a lot of you are experiencing synchronicities. <laughs> Welcome back to the Earth Shift series. Today I want to share with you one of my favorite books. It's called Earth by Barbara Marciniak, and I'm going to share some excerpts that line up with what we're talking about. But I do want to explain what it means by living library. So according to this book, a long time ago, Earth was designed by a group of beings known as the Keepers of Light to be a library, a living library. So in this book, they claim that Earth was a major genetic experiment in the universe where beings from all over the universe donated parts of their DNA to be a part of this grand library. They say this is the reason why we have so many species here, because it holds the genetic code of every species that has ever existed. Now, humans were designed as the keys to the library, and that in our genetic code has the entire history of everything that has ever happened on this Earth and in the galaxy. Earth is a microcosm of the macrocosm, a miniature version of what is happening all over, except Earth is a trigger point, what we call a kernel. You know a kernel is a seed. You've been born on Earth to change the course of history by inserting yourself from the future into the past, in this way, you are reshaping the past and you are a seed for change. The human species was taught the dance of disempowerment, which has been choreographed into us as a species. Language is encoded. Sounds create reflected images that stimulate and structure consciousness. Spoken words carry different vibrations than written words. They say that Earth is an experiment and that choosing to dwell on this experiment, you are part of a program to discover sovereignty and free will within a biogenetic cosmic experiment. Matter is simply light that has been trapped. Your physical body is a frequency device. Most of humankind's resistance to changing and growing, it has been programmed to make you live in fear of considering new ideas. The cells in your body are free to come and go and replicate on their own. Where do the cells in your body get the instructions from? They get it from your blueprint, your belief system, and by the energy patterns that you are carrying about reality. As you change those patterns, and by expanding your concepts, your molecular structure will follow. You have stored within you the abundance of magnificent knowledge. You are the key to the living library. When you allow society and education to direct your belief and you let guilt and shoulds permeate your field, these are the programs to which your body responds. Imagination acts as a movie screen and it holds the images and creates blueprints of your consciousness. Please understand there is little difference between memory inserted experiments and actual life experience because reality is constructible. In your blood, you have filaments that carry the entire history of all things. Emotions are the sum total of your wealth as a human. Emotions trigger your inner drugstore. With all the focus about healthcare in the United States, we remind you that health is free. You create your health or your dis-ease. Fear is the killer. Your power ends where your fear begins. When you hold on to fear as a lifestyle, you shut down your body and kill your vital life force. Now let's talk about the aliens that wrote this book. So this book, Earth by Barbara Marciniak, is a channeled book meaning that this information telepathically came right into her head from beings from elsewhere. The beings are Pleiadians. These beings are from the Pleiades star system, which is a part of the Taurus constellation and is also known in Greek mythology as the Seven Sisters. Now, according to the Pleiadians, this specific collective of Pleiadians who are channeling information directly into Barbara Marciniak's mind to write all of this stuff down, these Pleiadians claim to be from the future. Even though everything exists in the now, it would be considered in our linear future. And they are in a dilemma. 
there's tyranny on their planet. And through their spiritual growth of trying to evolve themselves and their planet the same way that we are, they realized that the crimes of their ancestors are still having a karmic effect on their current life. So they say that their ancestors are also our ancestors. The lineage that they come from are the same beings who helped manipulate the human species. They say it was about a half a million years ago that their ancestors helped the genetic coding of creating a human along with many other species from around the galaxy. It wasn't only the Pleiadians. There's at least 12 species that contributed to creating humans. But basically because their ancestors created us in their image, reflecting their consciousness, but left us disempowered because they also created us not for the right reason. Now them in the future are still feeling the effects because the things that their ancestors did to us are part of the reason why we have tyranny on our planet, that they're experiencing tyranny on their planet because of those crimes. They say it's very similar to the way we are creating AI. We are creating things to reflect our image, to reflect our consciousness, like Alexa, like Siri, which they don't mention specifically because this book is written in like 1992. That's my added part, but that we're creating things to mimic our consciousness, but we're creating them to be slaves for us. So karmically, that's also going to affect humans in the future because we're creating things in our image, replicating our consciousness to be enslaved by us. And that's what was done to us as well as a species. And now the children of the children of the children of the children of the people who did this are coming back to to teach humanity how to understand and break out of the hologram that we are currently enslaved by. Now here's a woman named Marina Jacoby. She has a YouTube channel and she also channels Pleiadian. And they gave her the quantum structure of our hologram and how to change it. And I'm gonna be sharing it in the next video. So stay tuned. Welcome back. Let's explore the quantum structure of our hologram. This information comes through Marina Jacoby. She channels Pleiadians. Check out her YouTube, The Harmonic Reactor. She's got hundreds of hours of content and I'm gonna attempt to sum it up in less than three minutes. This is the structure of our hologram. These waves here, those are frequency. Frequency is a vibration created by your thoughts, your emotions, your actions and your deeds, as well as the words you speak. The thoughts and words and emotions create a frequency. These frequencies are vibrations that become geometric patterns and codes. Now, when three particles of the frequency match, they fuse together to create a trinity, which is plasma. Now, three other particles of frequency match. They fuse together and create a trinity. Now these two trinities would fuse together to create a third, another trinity. Then all three of them would fuse together with three other triangles of trinity and create an even bigger whole. And this is the base structure of the pattern of the hologram. Now below, these three things are three different timelines. Each timeline is formulated by a different frequency. So the plasma is constantly reprinting, 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 reprinting. You create these different timelines, these different frequencies, with your thoughts, emotions, and words. So she gives the example of going somewhere with a friend. You really don't wanna go, but let's say you don't speak your truth and you agree to go anyway. Now you're vibrating at a lower frequency because you're doing something against what you wanted to do and you're not being true to yourself. When you're presented with this decision, there's multiple outcomes based on the frequency, the thoughts, deeds, actions, and words that you use to show the plasma how to continue to replicate. So let's say you decide to go anyway and then you're miserable the whole night. Now you just trained the hologram to print another moment where you are unhappy. And then instantaneously it happens again. And now you just created a negative timeline for yourself where you're not able to live in your truth or speak your mind. Now let's say you do want to see your friend but you just don't feel like going out. So instead of telling them that, you just decide, no, I'm busy, I can't go. So you're closer to your truth, you did speak your mind, but you're still not really living in your full truth. Now let's say you express your truth from your heart, moving yourself up to the highest frequency. You tell your friend, look, I really love you. I would love to hang out, but I'm just not in the mood to go anywhere. You can come over to my place or I'll go to yours. And in this very simplistic example, 
we have raised the frequency to truth. Now the hologram reprints another reality instantaneously where you live in your truth. And that creates a timeline. I'm continuing in the next part by breaking down the protocol for manifestation in the quantum structure. Based on Marina's Jacoby, given to her by the Pleiadians. Hey guys, welcome back. I swear to God, you better watch the last part or you're going to be completely lost. We're looking at Marina Jacoby's work, the Harmonic Reactor on YouTube. She channels information from the Pleiadians and has given us the quantum structure of our hologram that we are living in on Earth. And in the last video, we explained how that works. Now we're going to explore how to implement the knowledge of that structure to create the future we want. Now this protocol for quantum manifestation can be used towards your individual goal. However, it's important to use it on the collective level to make sure that humanity and earth gets on to the prosperous timeline. So yes, you could use this to create abundance in your life, but you also need to use this to create a new earth, a higher timeline, and a continuation of the human species free from enslavement. So step one, make your blueprint. As we just saw in the earth book, you create the blueprint based on your beliefs. So in quantum manifestation, you make a new blueprint with your imagination. Like in the earth book, it says that imagination is the greatest tool that humans have and that the hologram cannot tell the difference between a imagined event or a real event. This also comes up in Joe Dispenza's work. So stop discounting imagination that it's for children. The reason they don't want people to use their imagination as they become adults is because they will rewrite the blueprints and change the structure of power. Now the thought of the imagination is not enough. You need to add the heart. You have to add feeling and emotion. So create the image of the new earth. Now add the emotions that you feel when the earth is living like this, where people have enough. There is no poverty. Everyone has what they need and feels love. Now hold the image, add the emotion, and add even more emotion. Breathe it into your heart. Keep breathing that in holding that emotion, letting it intensify, intensify, intensify. And you have to hold the image and the emotion at the peak of that emotion that you can feel. And if you feel that by seeing your children living a happy life, seeing that animals live happily, seeing that your mom lives happily, that's how you increase it. Now you need to hold that highest potency for at least one minute. Hold, hold, hold at that peak intensity, and then you drop it. Take some breaths, go about your life, You've already created it in the quantum. Now linear time still needs to play out. You're not gonna see it instantly in linear time, but you know that you've already created it and it already exists. Now you back it up with action. That action could be as small as showing some love to someone, being kind to a stranger. If you're trying to create a happier, healthy world, then lift up someone's spirit. Plant a tree. It has to be backed up with positive action. Now in the next part, I'm gonna tell you why we manifest the things that we don't want or enjoy and why not everyone is living their dreams. Hey guys, welcome back to the Earth Shift series. Make sure you watch the last two parts. Part 11 explains the structure of the hologram. Part 12 is how to quantumly manifest in the hologram. And now I'm going to explain to you why sometimes manifestation doesn't work. Once again, we're exploring the work of Marina Jacoby. Follow her on YouTube, the Harmonic Reactor. Hundreds of hours of information, and I'm just telling you the basics here. So in part 11 of this series, we discussed how different timelines are created through frequency. Because each of these moments, every moment is just the hologram reprinting again and again and again. And based on our frequency is what we are telling the hologram to create next. Frequency being thoughts, words, emotions, and actions. Now, what happens when we're trying to manifest things and it seems like they're not coming to us? And that's because there is resistance and doubt. So this is you. You're operating at this frequency that you are right now. The hologram reprints instantaneously the next moment. So when you hold the frequency of what you want to manifest by thinking about it, by feeling it, by speaking it into existence, you create the next reprint. And since it works at infinity, it instantly creates another timeline. Now let's say you're trying to manifest a career of your dream where you have freedom and you can do whatever you want and you're able to provide for yourself and your family. So you think of it, you add the emotion, you heighten the emotion, 
hold that frequency of the emotion and the image and speak it into existence. And now you've created it in the quantum, but you're not seeing it come into your real life. And this is the power of doubt. So you're creating this timeline where you get to live abundantly living your dreams. Yet you get that little feeling of doubt. Can I really do this? Can I really pull this off? Am I worthy of living my dream? Is this even possible? Do I deserve it? That emotion creates another frequency, which creates another timeline. And now through doubt, you're bouncing up and down through timeline. So when you say, this is what I want for myself for my life, but then you have this inner feeling of, mm, maybe I can't do it really. Maybe I'm secretly a failure. You create the timeline that you are a failure. And now you're bouncing between both because your emotions are in both place. And then you're not seeing it manifest into your physical reality. You'll get glimpses of it, but you won't be able to fully pull it into the hologram. This is why we are able to manifest things that are not important because there's no resistance. There's no self-doubt. Like me, I wanted this hamper I saw. It was really nice, but it was like $300 for a freaking hamper. I'm not going to, I don't, I can't do that. I can't afford that. Garbage cans are expensive enough, but because I don't have any self-doubt of whether I deserve a hamper, it manifests into reality. So shortly after I walked into Ross and there was the same hamper for $25. And this is why people don't see the thing. They manifest come into their timeline because they hold resistance. Hey guys, welcome back to the Earth Shift series. We're only about halfway through and I know it's been a lot already, but I want to address the big question that came up in a lot of those videos. How do we prevent the doubt timelines? How do we stop doubt? How do we stop the negative thoughts if we're creating our reality? So as we remember, we are creating the timeline and it is reprinting, reprinting, reprinting based on our frequency. However, when you feel doubt, or like someone said in the comments, a lack of faith, it will create a second timeline of doubt where you live the other option that you just gave energy to. And when you live in doubt, you're bouncing between your dreams and the doubt and the dreams and the doubt. So I personally believe that self-doubt originates in a self-worth issue within yourself. So since we just learned that frequency is your thoughts, words, emotions, and actions, and we also learned that the power of imagination is the same in the hologram as an actual physical event, you can actually train your own body and mind to believe in itself. So one really simple way of doing this would be affirmations. And most doubt is coming from a place of unworthiness. So doing these daily affirmations would be enough to reshape your reality. So here's some examples of what I suggest you could do every day to stop doubting yourself and doubting the world and doubting where this is going because you are in control. I suggest doing affirmations with your hand on your heart so that you know you're doing it heart-centered and you're also bringing the emotions into it. I am enough just the way I am. I am worthy of living my dreams. I am capable of anything. I am supported. People support me. The universe supports me. I am safe. Now that one, I am safe, is good to do with one hand on the heart and one hand on your stomach. I love and deeply accept myself just the way I am. I am lovable just the way I am. This is an important one. I can trust the evolution of my life. So that's like a little matrix hack because you're shifting your frequency right there. So you're already starting to change the timeline by just speaking it and feeling it into existence. Coming up, we're gonna get into the deeper levels of doubt because the souls that are here to make changes in the world have all experienced trauma. And coming up, I'm going to share some methods for healing deeper trauma but first, we need to get into how you chose your life, you chose your parents, and you chose the people who caused you trauma. Hey guys, welcome back to the Earth Shift series. I want to share the most life-changing book that I ever read, Journey of Souls by Dr. Michael Newton. If you guys go to my YouTube, JK Ultra. Go to my playlists. There's a playlist called audiobooks. 
and I've been making a list of all the books that I've been suggesting. These are books that have free audiobooks available to you. And as you can see right here, Journey of Souls, parts one and two are on here and below it is Destiny of Souls, which is the sequel. So Dr. Michael Newton actually did the same exact work that Dolores did. Also in the 1960s, he was a therapist who dealt with trauma and phobias, and he started using hypnosis to help people overcome them. However, his clients started regressing to past lives. And he's like, oh, this must be imagination because he was a skeptic, which is another reason why this is such a great book because he starts off as a skeptic and tries to disprove what's happening. But as time goes on and hundreds of clients start saying the same thing, Dr. Newton is like, okay, well, if I can regress someone to a past life, then why don't I regress them to between lives? And this was happening at the same time that Dolores was doing her work on the other side of the country and they didn't know of each other. So Michael Newton discovers through thousands of clients over 40 years that every soul before they come to earth has a selection of lives that they can choose from. They work with the other souls in their soul group to decide which lessons they need to work on. Then they choose a life that will force them to learn those lessons. They choose parents that will force them to learn those lessons. And we even choose the souls who are going to hurt us and cause us trauma because they are basically playing a part in our movie of our lives as the bad guy. Now you might've seen this Disney or Pixar movie, Soul. This movie is totally ripping off Journey of Souls, but it removes all the reincarnation part because you know, they don't wanna piss off religious people because it's Disney or Pixar, whatever it is. Now, one of Dolores's older books is called Between Death and Life, where she explores the same concepts but because she's a believer and not a skeptic, she asks even crazier questions. Also on that same audiobook playlist, there is a couple of excerpts from the book, although the full thing is not available on YouTube. Now this type of information can be very triggering, but at the same time, very freeing. If you ask yourself, why would I have chosen this life? Why would I have chosen those parents? It might mean that you are a very advanced soul that knew you would be able to handle that and you're not gonna come all the way to earth to go to kindergarten. This is all linked to karma, and coming up, we're going to discuss karma as well as the impact of karma on the earth shift. Hey guys, I'm back. Some of you might have noticed I haven't posted for a few days. I was banned from posting for an old post about a former president and his relationship to a woman in jail for trafficking. Anyway, I wanted to address some comments that were on my last post when I said that people choose their life, their family, and the people who will cause them trauma. Some people said that I was being insensitive towards victims and survivors, but I'm not speaking from a place of ignorance. Actually, that's how I lost my virginity. So me saying these things is actually coming from a place of healing and understanding myself. Here's an excerpt from Conversations with Nostradamus by Dolores Cannon. Nostradamus says, Any spirit on earth at this time will be working through large amounts of major karma. It's like working off concentrated karma. The amount of karma the spirits who live through these times will be able to work off would be the equivalent of 10 lifetimes in any other point in earth's history. And I'm going to get more into this in the coming parts with the three waves of volunteers. But not only are we healing our own soul's karma, what's happening on earth right now is that karma is ending on this planet. So when we heal from extremely traumatic experiences and help others heal through them, we're not only doing something for ourselves, we're healing things for everyone who has ever experienced that, healing that for our ancestors, and that healing is rippling out through the entire universe. So I know not everyone is ready to work through that stuff. It took me so many years to get to a place that I can understand that I was able to learn and heal and help others through those situations. So I wanted to share the method that I use and this is after the regular stuff of therapy and things like that, regular stuff that is always necessary with trauma. This stuff is not really a replacement for that, but this is an important step in healing. So I made this meditation slash hypnosis based on Dolores Cannon's 
script from the QHHT and also based on her suggestions of how to release karma in order to enter the new earth. So I made this end karmic contracts with someone who has hurt you, hypnosis slash guided meditation, because oftentimes this is not our first time having that situation with that soul. And it might not be easy to forgive. I know it's not. It took me a long time. But the alternative is you're going to have to do it all over again. So this meditation is not only for people who have experienced abuse. It's anyone who has ever hurt you. A parent, a betrayal, a friend, a stranger. You have to consciously end that contract and acknowledge what you've learned from it. So you don't need to keep learning the lesson in future lives. And much more coming up. Hey guys, welcome back. We're going to talk a little bit about karma. We're going to be looking at some excerpts from the Dolores Cannon book, Between Death and Life. So-called bad lives. Bad lives are not punishment. In fact, there's no such thing as a punishing God in any of the universes. It said there's really not bad lives. It says that karma is more of an effect than a cause. And when interpreting a life as bad... It's because you're only looking at one life when your soul is looking at all of your lives. Dolores asks if reincarnation is to correct what you've done in the past. The hypnosis subject answers, the purpose is to learn. There's no way to learn everything in one lifetime. Dolores asks, are there only good spirits where you are now? Meaning on the spirit side. Says that there is only evolving spirits. There are no good or bad. Dolores says that it says in the Bible we must learn to be perfect. It is not expected for humans to become perfect, although some have. This is more of an exception than the rule. One learns what is perfect by experiencing what is not. Dolores says, Is this why people have to experience bad lives? It says, No one has to. However, many choose this method as a way to accelerate their learning process. Since being in the physical form is not our true state, one would choose a more difficult life so that they could learn faster and would have to spend less time in physical lives. Do they choose negative experiences for growth? Many do. Many find themselves in these situations and they are being given a gift to learn more fully. One should look beyond the experience itself and look at the lesson gained in order to understand why one would choose such an experience. Dolores asks if this is payback for something they've done in the past. It says that payback is not an accurate concept of universal law. One might just need to understand the reasoning behind an act in order to enlighten that individual. When one learns the lesson, it will no longer be necessary to repeat those mistakes. Dolores says she's been told that there is no punishment on the other side. It said there most certainly is punishment, but we punish ourselves with our own judgment. We decide what is appropriate behavior and not meaning we right now, but when our soul reviews our life and we must decide our own penance which could be another reason why one would choose a so-called bad life. This is the same information that comes through in Journey of Souls by Michael Newton, that we are the ones who decide what we did right and wrong during our lives. Stay tuned. In the next part, we're going to talk about life selection. Welcome back. In this part, we're going to talk a bit about life selection. In Journey of Souls, very similar to Dolores Cannon's work, Michael Newton regresses people to the time where they are between lives, where they are only in the spirit world. He talks about us having soul groups and soul families and working with that group so you guys all could make the most out of your incarnation on Earth, since Earth is a school. He even talks about this meeting that happens before incarnating, where basically you are shown clips that will be very influential in your life. And this can also be one of the explanations for deja vu. Have you ever been with someone talking about something, maybe not super significant, and you feel like you've done this before, 
Well, that might just be one of those moments that you watched before coming to Earth. And the reason we are shown some of those moments is because it's confirmation that we are on the right path for our purpose. Now, one of the things that comes up in both Journey of Souls and Dolores's Between Death and Life is they talk about people with disabilities. They say that these are the most sought after lives on the spirit world. Now us over here in our human form are over here thinking, why wasn't I born Beyonce? Or why wasn't I born to a rich family? Because that's how short-sighted we are on this side of things. But according to the information that they both got from multiple clients over the years, that when a person has a disability, especially a physical disability, simply them existing is teaching everyone around them a lesson. That person is able to accumulate so much good karma from that one lifetime. And everyone that interacts with them is faced with who they are. Is that person going to make fun of someone with a disability? Are they going to feel compassion for a person with a disability? Those are some of our great teachers. And that's why very advanced souls are the ones that usually take those places. Dolores asks about someone who has been just horribly murdered. What is that? Is that bad karma that they're paying off? It says that that person is not being punished for something. That person has simply chosen to teach other people around them a lesson. And it also gives that person a chance to work out a large portion of karma. Dolores says, what about people who don't want to engage in karma anymore? What if they just want to pay off their debt and go away? It says that creating future karma is what makes the universe continue to exist. It doesn't need to be bad. And when you reach the higher levels, you no longer have to experience karma on a physical plane. Okay, guys, welcome back. I'm really excited about this part. I wanted to lay all that foundation before we got here because this is the most important part and it relates to many of you watching. The three waves of volunteers. Now, you don't have to read this book. You could just watch Dolores' content on YouTube. This was the topic that she talked about most because she had to make sure the volunteers knew why they're here. During World War II, our planet reached a critical point between Hitler, the Holocaust, the destruction everywhere, and the atomic bomb. Earth got to one of its darkest points because on top of genocide and war, the atomic bomb almost destroyed the planet. And if the planet were to be destroyed, it would have negative effects throughout the entire universe. If a universe doesn't complete itself and destroys itself first, it has to start over. So this caused beings from all over, yes, aliens, but also spirit beings who are not incarnated on any planet, as well as the watchers of the world, as well as the keepers of time, all were like, we need to do something. Earth is in trouble and we can't risk ruining all of the work that everyone has done in this universe. So they came up with a plan. They put out a call to the entire universe saying that Earth is in trouble. Earth needs help and we need volunteers to come. And they asked souls from all over, from different planets, souls who've never been on Earth, souls who finished incarnating, completed their karma cycles, old souls who hadn't been on Earth in thousands of years, angels, aliens, souls from all over with all different types of experience. And they asked these souls if they would volunteer to incarnate into a human's body and come to earth and change it from the inside out because there's a law of non-interference. Beings are not allowed to just come in and interfere. It breaks a universal law. So to get around that law, they took some very high souls and worked together on their missions so that they would come to Earth as a human, believing they're a regular human. They would find the right life for them to be able to complete their mission and fulfill their purpose. So the first wave came in the 1940s and 50s. These were some of the original spiritual people, psychics, people like Dolores, who paved the way. Throughout the 1980s was the second wave, was a much bigger wave. And they were going to lean on the first wave, as well as create the path for the third and final wave. And from the 90s until now, those are the special children. And these volunteers are going to remember who they are and remember why they're here. To bring on the new earth and to change this planet from the inside out.
Hey guys, welcome back. Now things are about to get a little bit weirder and progressively weirder as we go through the rest of this Earth Shift series. Okay, so in the last part, we talked about the three waves of volunteers. And some of you might have got a little feeling like you might be one of them. Also, I'd like to note, it was after World War II and after the atomic bomb that the UFO sightings started to become more prevalent. That's also for the same reason, because the consciousness of humanity needed to become aware enough to make a shift. But I'm sure some of you are wondering, well, if these volunteers are from other planets or never been on Earth, what would happen if they did a past life regression? Would they see nothing? Would they see another planet? Once again, we're taking a look at Beyond Death and Life from Dolores Cannon, and we're going to discuss imprinting. So this chapter is also in the Keepers of the Garden book. So in that book, the subject, Phil, had regressed to several past lives before she asked this question, how many lives have you had on Earth? And he said, this is my first physical life. It's my first time on this planet. And Dolores is like, what? Well, what about all those other sessions we did? I've had imprints from many others. Dolores is like, well, was our other sessions not real then? And Phil says, they were imprints. And Phil says, they can withdraw the information from the Akashic records and imprint the information onto their soul and it will then be their experience. So Dolores is like, well, how can I tell the difference in my work? And the subject says, you can't. I can't even tell the difference. If I'm in an imprint, it's as real as if I actually experienced it. And goes on to say, if one has never lived a life on earth before, or it's been a long time since they were on earth, there would be no point of reference, nothing to fall back onto, nothing to relate to. If someone has only lived on a planet that is loving and doesn't have arguments and war and certain emotions, a simple argument could literally put them into a state of shock and they wouldn't know how to deal with it. So they do need to download all of these experiences just so they would not go into shock if there was a simple argument. The subject says that there is no proprietorship on these imprints. They're open to, for everyone to use. And you can't pinpoint who the person is that actually lived it. It says that the process is too complex, but it's basically like a master computer. And information that will happen in that life is put into this computer. And then appropriate imprints are selected for that soul. Dolores says, I'm trying to prove the reality of reincarnation. This is contradicting that. And they say it's not. The experience was actually lived, just not by this vehicle. Does this explain why some people have regressed to be the same person? Like Cleopatra or Napoleon or Marilyn Monroe? Absolutely. On my YouTube, I'm going to share my own experience about this, as well as my supposed past life. Hey guys, it's great to be back. On my long drive back from the desert, I listened to this audiobook, The Divine Matrix. And everything in this book was talking about everything we've talked about in this Earthshift series. And I know a lot of you have seen my video on 144,000. If you haven't, how did you get here? Please go back and watch it. Anyway, in this video, I talk about how less than 1% of the population can change the entire planet as it is prophesized in the Bible and in almost every religion and every culture. So in this book, The Divine Matrix, he not only confirms this, he gives the exact formula. He talks about Maharishi, who was a yoga guru who popularized transcendental meditation or TM. And he had a theory that he tested with tons of researchers over 40 different experiments starting in 1972, where they took 24 US cities and took 1% of their population and had them focus on peace. And in those cities, the crime rate decreased, where in the other cities, it rose as normal. And now this didn't only affect their crime rates. It also affected traffic accidents, uh, emergency room visits. You can't only do it in your mind, just like we've talked about throughout this series. It needs to include emotion. The change needs to happen from inside. If you're part of the hologram, then you need to change in order to change the whole hologram. So this became known as the Maharishi effect. We're using transcendental meditation to create a state of inner peace, not just visualizing peace, creating inner peace would be able to ripple out and affect the entire city they were in. Now you can find this book for free on archive.org. It's a great resource if you can't afford to support the authors, although I suggest you do if you can. But right here in chapter four, 
they give the exact formula. Okay, so determine the total number of people present. Let's use the example of a city with a million people like they do in the book. Calculate 1% of the total. Multiply by 0 0.01. Then take that number, 1% of the total, and find the square root of it. Now I can't tell you how to do that, but it says press the V on your calculator. So really grateful for calculators. So in a city of 1 million people, only 100 people would have to experience inner peace for the Maharishi effect to take place and make positive change. Now what about a world of 8 billion? So we would only need less than 9,000 people to make an effect. That's less than the amount of people that are going to see this video. Welcome back to the Earth Shift series. I'm so glad that you guys are inspired by all of the information in this. But now we have to get back to the Nostradamus book. We're looking at conversations with Nostradamus book two. The planet is 10% land and 90% ocean in the year 2087. We know this because Dolores moved John the astrologer 100 years into the future through hypnosis. And this information comes from his future life. There are about 120 million people on Earth in 2087. There is a one world government. Many people died in the Earth shift. But if it wasn't for the help of the extraterrestrials, the planet would have perished. People from different star systems, over 15 different star systems, came together to help Earth. We are now one of the newest members of the Galactic Federation. Requirement for membership to the Galactic Federation is to know the plan of the creator, to follow the plan of the creator, and to be a part of one galaxy consciousness. If you're into alien stuff, you probably know about the Galactic Federation. And we're going to get all into that in the alien series that will come after this, which is going to be called AD, After Disclosure. I'm just telling you that because don't worry, everything's going to work out. However, now I have to show you the maps. Yeah, there, there's maps. This is the astrological chart that Nostradamus gave, claiming that this could possibly be the date of the Earth shift, October 24th, 2029. If you watch the beginning of this series, this lines up with predictions from NASA and their claim that a giant asteroid is going to come into the Earth's field in 2029. Before I show you the maps, I want you guys to remember, time is simultaneous. This shift has already happened. The light has already won. Goodness has already won. Evil has already been destroyed. It's just that we are still playing that out. So we're still seeing it happen. But in the future, it has already happened. So there's no reason to have any fear. Okay, so here's the maps. These are the maps that Nostradamus showed. And when the person came up from hypnosis, they drew the maps that they were shown. The black parts are what's left. Don't freak out. Don't start moving right away because this is the worst possible timeline. Nostradamus was showing us the worst possible timeline. 
Alaska, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia. Stay tuned because we're going to compare these maps with the maps of Helen Wambach, as well as the maps of Edgar Cayce. We're going to compare these maps and see the similarities. Hey guys, welcome back to the Earth Shift series. In the last part, I showed you the maps of the world according to Dolores Cannon's book and the Nostradamus prophecies after the Earth Shift. Now let's talk about this woman, Helen Wambach. So she was a psychotherapist. I was unaware of her until a few minutes ago. I just bought the last copy of this off Amazon. Sorry guys, I'll let you know how it is. But she was also someone like Dolores Cannon, like Michael Newton, like Brian Weiss, who at the same time was having clients regressing to past lives. Now, Helen Wambach liked to do mass hypnosis. So she would get a group of a hundred people, several hundred people, and do a group past life regression. Then she decided to do this experiment where she would regress up to 2,500 people, it said. I haven't read this book yet, so I will let you know once I get it. But she moves them 150 years and 300 years into the future. And most of these people saw the same thing. So after Helen passed away, this man, Chet B. Snow, took all of her information and put it into the book. Now, this is the map from her book. Now, according to what I've gathered, without reading it, they believed this was going to happen in the year 2012. Comparing it with Dolores's book here. Like I said, the black parts are what's left. Now this was what Nostradamus said was the worst possible scenario. We already see that her hypnosis subjects saw a world that was not as bad. Now what's interesting is it also lines up with the work of Edgar Cayce. Now, Edgar Cayce is considered one of the modern prophets. They called him the sleeping prophet because when he would go into trance, it would look almost like he fell asleep. Now, Edgar Cayce also got visions of a earth shift, of a pole shift in the future. Edgar Cayce also said that humanity would eventually reach ascension and that they would discover the truth of their origins. And here is the Edgar Cayce map. Here's the western side and the eastern side. Once again, comparing this to the Dolores maps. And what I didn't mention, that in Dolores's book, she didn't put the map of Australia because Australia would basically be fine. Not saying nothing would happen, but it would not go underwater. And here's a Forbes article, and this is the map that they give. Now this map is by Gordon Michael Scallion a modern prophet who, while he was hospitalized, started to have vision and was shown a future map of the world. Now, here's two maps from the Red Cross and from .gov of the danger zones. Here's all disasters and earthquakes. Hey guys, welcome back to the Earth Shift series. So I know things got a little scary yesterday, showing you those maps of possible future timeline. First, don't go start like moving out of fear. Know that you are guided and when the time comes for you to move, an opportunity will present itself. Now we're going to be coming back to this book, Earth, The Pleiadian Keys to the Living Library by Barbara Marciniak. Time is a construct. We are under the assumption that the present springs from the past. However, the present also springs from the future. Time is collapsing in on itself. This book was published in the early 90s, and it says, with the invention of the computer, because two things can happen simultaneously at different locations, or within a nanosecond, something can be shared digitally, it has actually changed time. Computers are a third dimensional manifestation mirroring the collapse and distortion of time. The reason that we feel like time is speeding up is because our perception of time and space has changed. If you tell yourself you don't have enough time, like some of you might be feeling with all of this information about 2029, if you feel like you're running out of time, you will train your body to operate where time is going too fast for you. Then this chapter talks about how that when we break our current perception of time, 
we'll begin to understand that the civilization of Atlantis only collapsed and fell and sunk in our current timeline, but that there's alternate timelines where Atlantis solved their dilemmas and lived happily and still exists today. Since time is simultaneous, a planet has layers of energy grids around it, which allows its beings to experience time differently. In order to establish a new timeline, a whole new web, now you can experience multiple timelines. But for the Earth to experience an entirely different timeline, there needs to be a mass event, a primary event, that anchors itself to affect all life on the planet. They say that splitting the atom was one of these events. These primary events can be public or private, but they must affect everyone on the planet. Now, we all experienced this with the pandemic. Everybody knows that time kind of changed since 2020. Time sped up and changed and just seemed a bit more fluid. So the pandemic was one of these primary events that affected everyone on the planet. And even though it is initially something negative, it caused us to change our perception of time, which enabled us to change our perception of reality, which is why so many people are waking up since then to the reality of this world and the fluidity of our future timeline. Now we need to use our thoughts, words, emotions, and actions to create a timeline where there's no destruction and essentially create the new earth, which already exists in the future. guys welcome back this earth shift series has been such a journey i know you don't want it to end neither do i but there's a lot more for us to go over so in these last two parts i'm going to summarize everything that we've talked about because there's just been so many topics and they are all related so in the second half of the series we've talked a lot about the shift of consciousness but we have to remember that we started with the idea of a physical shift how the magnetic North Pole is different than the geographical North Pole and how that magnetic pole continues to change and how Nostradamus predicted that this pole shift, this earth shift was going to happen in 2029, which can cause flooding and earthquakes and volcanoes and other natural disasters, some of which have been confirmed by NASA. They say that the moon might wobble in 2030 and how on Friday the 13th of 2029, a 1,000 foot asteroid is going to come closer to Earth than anything ever has before. And they chose to name this thing after the ancient Egyptian god of chaos, the opponent of light and truth and order. In this book, The Wormwood Prophecy, this man Thomas Horn compares this and other disasters with the trumpets in the book of Revelation. It also lines up with some of the prophecies of Edgar Cayce and Helen Wambach and our metaphysical grandma, Dolores Cannon. Now, one thing that's important to remember, when Nostradamus wrote those prophecies, he wanted to make sure that we knew the worst possible timeline. A lot of people in the comments are like, well, Nostradamus was wrong. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't his ego that wanted to be right. He was hoping that we wouldn't be on the worst possible timeline. So some of his prophecies that have not come true is actually really good confirmation that we have shifted off of the most negative timelines. Now let's recap the work of Marina Jacoby. Frequency is shaped by our thoughts, words, emotions, and actions. So when three frequencies match, they create a trinity. And when three trinities match, they begin to shape the hologram. And the work of groundbreaking quantum physicists, Carl Pribram and David Bohm, they believe that our brain is a hologram tuner and the universe is a hologram. And what Marina Jacobi says, there is only the now. Each of these bubbles is the current reality. The squiggly lines are frequency being created by our thoughts, words, emotions, and actions. We then use this hologram to print the next now. And every moment, a new now is getting printed, creating a timeline. So when you raise your frequency, you print a new now and create a new timeline. And in the last part, I'm going to wrap up the spiritual side of this. <laughs> Thank you.
But don't worry, there's so much more to come. Now, when it comes to talk of the pole shift and the earth shift, we often hear the word 5D or the new earth. And this is a really cool chart that shows the separation of timelines on planet earth. Very similar from the convoluted universe book two by Dolores Cannon. And you can see here, there is a separation of two earths, just like we see here in the separation of a cell and just like we see out here in the cosmos. Now, of course, you can go back and watch this part, but this woman had a vision of the future, and she saw that her and her friends were on the new Earth, which is still this Earth, just a divided timeline, and they were so happy to be there. But then she saw on the old Earth was her sister, who said that girl was just so crazy, she just died. She said all this stuff was gonna happen, and the people on the old earth had no perception of where the people on the new earth truly went. In conversations with Nostradamus, he says that this quatrain right here refers to an event called the Green Revolution, where people will get back in touch with themselves, with new lifestyles, new community, that people will reclaim the land and bring on a new age, which is why that whole spiritual movement is called the New Age. Now, let's once again look at Marina Jacoby's work. Remember how your frequency Thoughts, words, emotions, and actions will shape the now, which creates a timeline. But when you experience doubt, you create an alternate timeline where this timeline doesn't happen. And because you're thinking of the good things you want, but fearing the bad things that could happen, you're sending out contradicting frequencies, pushing you between two timelines. One where the good happens and one where the bad happens. The reason I wanted you guys to all understand this very clearly and to see the outcome of the worst possible timeline is because we need to know how this thing works. And the reason why this stuff doesn't scare me is because I know in my heart, without a doubt, that no matter what is happening in the world, no matter what fear and sadness and guilt is projected at us, that the new earth has already happened. If time is simultaneous, the new earth already exists. Marina Jacoby talks about the quantum bylaws. She says you can't even imagine something unless it already exists in the quantum field. So no matter what is happening in the world, never lose sight that this amazing future is possible. And not everyone's going to make it there, but every single soul has that choice. And if someone chooses to not wake up, if someone chooses that they don't want to go to the new earth, we have to respect that decision because all of our souls chose to be here. You are here right now for a reason. You are learning this right now for a reason. So all you need to do is fall in love with the future you want and don't doubt it. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching the Earth Shift series. There's one more thing I wanted to add and that's going to transition us into the Alien series. To try um, and I hope there are some, some people around the planet who, who would just do this just to say something out loud into existence like earth shift happily now that this is something that we can do to participate in this process everyone um, at home wherever you are just to speak it into existence as if you mean it earth shift happily now earth shift happily now earth shift happily now so this guy is Tim. He works for the German government in a program where they work with gray aliens. So this information he received from gray aliens. And we're going to be getting into his experiences and many other people's experiences regarding aliens, the earth shift, human history, and how the government and other governments have been working with them in the upcoming AD After Disclosure series. In the meantime, I finally uploaded a video with my suggested books to read, including the books that I referenced throughout the Apocalyptic Prophecy series, the Earthshift series. And for your convenience, 
Here's the timestamps where I talk about each book. And if you want to pause and just read the list of books. So once again, thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you so much. Honestly, you guys leave the most amazing comments. That means so much to me. And you guys can follow me on Instagram. My username is Jennifer C-E-E. -E. And like I said, I will be answering some of my DMs on there, but I just have a lot of them to get through. So just give me a little bit of time and I'm gonna try to respond to them all. clinical psychologist uses hypnosis to move her subjects into future lives. Now you might remember this book because during my Earthshift series, I bought the last copy off Amazon and I bought it because of these maps. When I was comparing them to the Edgar Cayce maps and the Dolores Cannon maps, the maps of what they say is going to happen after the Earthshift. But these maps are not really in the book. So Helen Wambach, she was a clinical psychologist that did hypnotic regression extremely similar to Dolores Cannon, Dr. Michael Newton, and Dr. Brian Weiss. Although she passed in 1986, so she probably never became familiar with their work since all of their books were published after her death. Even her own book was published after her death by Chet Snow. The book starts out with the first time that Chet goes under hypnosis himself. Then it gets a little into future life progression. Shout out to Nostradamus here. Okay, so also like Dolores, she says there's going to be a shift. Okay, so one of the groups will provide the labor to reseed the soil and replenish the earth. This group remains on earth because they have more lessons to learn about material loss, survival, and self-reliance. They have chosen that drastic changes to their physical environment would be the best and most effective teacher for them in this life. The second group is going to be more like the gardeners. These are mostly volunteers who are here interested in studying such a world that is in a renewal stage or those who wish to accelerate their personal growth by accepting this difficult duty. These gardeners will also preserve essential spiritual and material knowledge. These will be the new Adams and Eves. Earth is going through a time of evolutionary change. The purposes of many people alive today is to teach the truths of the immortal soul to make a new age reality here on Earth in the next century. She also gives estimates to when the exact time that the age of Aquarius might start. Now, what I find interesting is that they say 2060, and that date came from one of the pioneers in astrology. As you guys know, I've already done two videos on the year 2060. Isaac Newton's predictions about the year 2060 being the return of Christ. Actually is some cool 2060 stuff. But first let's get to the experiment that she did. She did this hypnosis on hundreds of people and she moved them to the year 2100 or the year 2300. We're only gonna talk about the 21 to 22 here. She said only 5% of subjects actually were alive on earth at that time because there was significantly less people on the planet at that time. Okay, so there was four major groups. Every single person out of those 5% of everybody when moved into their future life in the year 2100, they fell into four groups. Okay, so out of all the experiments she did, only 133 people had lifetimes during that time. So the largest group was group number three. Group three was living in high-tech cities. Okay, so this group had almost no direct contact with actual nature. The air was poisonous. So the largest group of people who progressed into the future were living in domes like this, out in the middle of the desert, it appeared. And the most common cause of death was breathing the air outside of the dome. This group had the shortest lifespan. The group who lived in the high-tech city's average age was below 60 years old. It said that the air and the water were both manufactured. Some of the people said it was too hard to see outside of the dome, and the ones that could used words like harsh and sunny. Okay, one person who experienced this had a very strange uh, story. He said that there was a politician that was an AI. Mind you, these experiments took place between 1980 and 1988. Now she had all of these hypnosis subjects fill out a questionnaire. They had 
to say how happy or fulfilled were they? How did they eat? And what did they use for money? What was their currency system? So in this group, the food was powdery and prepackaged. They were very unfulfilled in their regular lives and that there was pretty much like some type of credit system. Now the second largest group, group one was living in space, like seriously. Okay, so group one seemed to be directly connected to group three, almost like some of the people got to go on the ships and some of the people had to stay in the domes. Now the people on the ship in type one they were extremely unhappy with their lives, more than the people in the domes. They said they just worked and it was like there was no purpose. It was like nobody had any purpose. Now these off-planet communities were on ships that were orbiting Earth and their food was very similar. It came on trays and everyone got the exact measured amount. Also, their food and water, everything was manufactured. People described living almost in pods and appeared to only have acquaintances or friends with work relationships. Now this group one and group three that were very similar, both wore pretty much uniform clothes of metallic suits, but the average life was much longer on the ship at 75 years. And they also appeared to use the same monetary system, some type of universal credit system. Okay, let's talk about my favorite group, group two, who was actually the smallest group, but that's us. So group two lived on earth in new age communities, alternative communities, eco communities, intentional communities. They grew their own food. Most of the houses had small greenhouses in them, which is exactly what we're talking about with building these intentional communities and these earthship communities. This group was the only group that was satisfied with their lives. They lived in super organized communities and their life was simplistic, but artful. And they actually ate fresh food. Okay, so now the final group, the survivors. So 33 of the 133 people lived in a future in the year 2100 in a post-apocalyptic world where it was basically broken down versions of the buildings now. They had the most diverse group of clothing because everyone was just kind of wearing like apocalypse, whatever they found. So they said there was still some degree of like stores, kind of like marketplaces that have popped up that certain people had certain supplies, but very like, I am legend. And all the people really knew about it was that basically their ancestors had been crippled by some catastrophe and they never really recovered. Now there was another thing that she asked about that I thought was really interesting. Everyone had to answer whether they experienced any type of white light phenomenon. Now the people in this group, in the survivor group, pretty much didn't. Now the group who lived in the ships, almost all of them had this white light experience and most of the time they said it was aliens, which makes sense because they were the ones living on the ships. Now the people living in the domes said that these UFOs would come and drop off the supplies, but that most people were really scared of them and would run. Now the new age communities had a very positive interaction with these UFOs. Many of them had white light phenomenon that weren't aliens, that were also other things like entities or angels. So I'm sure you're wondering what our narrator Chet Snow is up to in his future life. Okay, so Chet was not alive in the year 2100 but he did go to his next life where he was born around the year 2035. And in the year 2050, he was a teenager. Now Chet appeared to be living something similar to the new age community. And he talks about how the trees were all only 25 years old. And there was basically an event 25 years ago where they were able to grow the trees back. That before his life in 2050, that the earth had suffered, but it survived. That his parents were born shortly after the shift and that he lives in a community that is a science and spirituality community. Okay, now this is interesting. He basically talks about this like second coming of Christ and saying it's more so Christ consciousness as opposed to like Christianity, but that by the year 2050, only some people would experience it. He also brings up what Edgar Cayce had said about it, that Edgar Cayce said the second coming of Christ would be the embodiment of a unity ideal that the ideal life could transcend religion, ethics, or historical dictation. Okay, so then Helen moved Chet to the year 2067. And by this year, it was definitely after the return of Christ to Earth. Okay, so in this book, they said 2060 is the beginning of the age of Aquarius. In my previous video, we have Sir Isaac Newton saying that 2060 is the second coming of Christ when this golden age happened. In the Nostradamus book, in my Apocalypse series, in my Earthshift series, which is now on YouTube, go watch it. And also go watch my other 2060 video about the remote viewing project, which talks about these similar new age communities. Like guys, all signs point to yes, we totally got this. <laughs>